I had an article in the New York Times that now sounds, feels like ages ago, I think right around Rosh Hashanah, so September 15th, 16th, on one of the ways of combating anti-Semitism is living a Jewish life. It won't stop the anti-Semites, but it, if you don't know what you're fighting for, then, or if, you, if all right. you know of your Jewish identity is I'm gonna fight, mm -hmm. then it's, you have nothing of, of the, the roots. Correct. I couldn't do my, my job here if I wasn't well-rooted right. in, in my Jewish identity. Hello everyone, I'm Jamie Geller, CMO of Aish, and I'm here with uh, Rabbi Steve Berg. The CEO of Aish. Thank you. Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt. She is the special envoy to monitor and combat anti-Semitism. We cannot think of a more seminal moment in history to be having this conversation with you today, Ambassador. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Um, you know, I say, and it's not in total, not even a, a little bit, in, maybe a little bit in jest, I'm working in a growth industry and business is booming. You know, I'd, I'd be happy for a recession. <laughs> wow. I've heard you say a tsunami of anti-Semitism. Yes, that's right. When I came into the office, one of the reasons I was attracted to come in, in to, to accept uh, uh, the, the nomination when the pres President Biden nominated me, uh, two reasons. First of all, because I saw a surge in anti-Semitism, there was no question. But uh, I also saw the opportunity to build relations with Gulf countries, uh, Abraham Accords, Heskameh Avraham, as they call them in Israel, um, with those countries that were part of the Abraham Accords, those countries that were not yet part of the Abraham Accords. And we did a lot of that. And uh, just yesterday, I was meeting with the Emiratis here in the building um, in the hope of, again, you know, doing things. And, uh, but some of that is on hold. Mm -hmm. I think that um, for every Jew in the world, there's pre-October 7th and post-October 7th. I'm sure coming in, you had certain thoughts about the job. And I'm wondering just for yourself how that shifted oh, with, it, as it the was, world changed. It changed. It was a, it was a world shift. Um, I was in Rome on October 7th. Wow. I was getting ready to go to shul. I was going to a small shul with mainly Libyan Jews, not mm -hmm. the, yeah. sure. not the uh, synagogue majore, the big one, yeah. but up, up in one of the hills. And I heard about it, and by the time I got to shul, the security people, who of course were listening, um, told us that the, they're apparently they're captives and things like that. It was early in the morning, you know, mm -hmm. it was the morning, yeah. but still, uh, and it was two hours from Israel or something, right. a different time. But, and then it changed dramatically, it changed dramatically. It has an impact, um, you know, I don't get, directly involved in Middle East political affairs in terms of United States government. There are many, many people in this building in mm -hmm. Israel and other places who work on that. Um, but so much of what we've seen since October 7th bisected anti-Semitism or maybe even worked in parallel to anti-Semitism. So there's been a lot to address. Wow, well, mm -hmm. well. You know, one of the questions that I'm often asked is, the relationship between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. That is on the tip of everyone's <laughs> tongue. It's like the buzzwords so right now. So let me make a point. Yes. Criticism of Israeli policy is not anti-Semitism. If that were the case, uh, the people who were marching in the streets for what, every Saturday night for seven months uh, yeah. because of the judicial reform would have been anti-Semites, which of course is ridiculous. So that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about people who question the right of Israel to exist, who attribute to Israel, who use the anti-Semitic stereotype and put it on Israel. Um, but now I have a different answer, certainly since October 7th when I'm asked that question. I'll go into anti-Zionism, anti-Semitism, how it's different today. In the 1920s and 30s, there were people who legitimately questioned, including many rebellion in Europe, whether, yeah. whether Zionism is, oh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what I do today is point out, I said, you're asking the wrong person. If you want to know the connection between hostility to Israel, anti-Israelism, anti-Zionism, and anti-Semitism. Ask the people who torched a shul in Montreal. Right. Ask the people who threw a rock through the window at a delicatessen in Toronto. Ask the people who marched in um, Philadelphia. Sydney, in, in, yeah. Phil in Philadelphia, exactly, or in Sydney, Australia, for the one of the first marches, supposedly pro-Palestinian, with the sign "Gas the Jews," yeah. or the people who've been marching with signs of a garbage can, and inside the garbage can is a Jewish star. 
they've answered the question for you. Don't ask me. Right. Look at right. Are you surprised? You know, I've spent my whole life studying the Shoah, teaching about the Shoah, um, studying anti-Semitism. So I'm, I'm not surprised, but I'm kind of shocked at the speed and the degree. I mean, if you look at the anti-Semitic the tracking, it started long before even Israel stepped a foot into Gaza. Remember, there was a long period, I don't know, two weeks, something Correct. like that, before they went in. Anti-Semitism was off the roof, yeah, off the charts, you know? Mm -hmm. So uh, that did surprise me. And the other thing that has surprised me and, and struck me is the um, denial, the denial of the rapes, the denial of the, what we call in this building, it's too antiseptic a term, gender-based violence. Yeah. Gender-based violence is an antiseptic term for rape, mutilation, particularly of women. Um, of course, we've now learned from some of the hostages that it's not just women who are being sexually abused, but it's primarily women in, in the most horrific fashion. Um, and that's been very striking. It's been, I, I was missing, I was with the Pope on October, I'd say about 10th, 11th, something like that, that week that I was in Rome. And we talked about it and he said, criminali, criminal, and I said, barbaric, and he said, correct. I think that, you know, in terms of Holocaust denial, that's something that we have been, for decades, we've been yeah. dealing with. Here, the denial was instantaneous. Instantaneous. Yes. And, and I think people were like, you know, now we understand, when, you know. That's right. No, Holocaust denial took uh, quite a few years to gain traction, et cetera. Uh, this was immediate, and you still have people saying, well, the rapes didn't happen, the, the hostage, here's the irony. The hostages didn't happen, but who's being released? You know, it, but right. but that's the whole thing with anti-Semitism. It does. It's a prejudice. Mm -hmm. Nonsensical. And think of, exactly. Yes. Think of the etymology of the word prejudice. Prejudge. Don't confuse me with the facts. I've made up my mind. Makes right. no sense. Right. You know, right. I see uh, a person walking down the street. I don't know a, a, a black-skinned person. Oh, they got their job through affirmative action. They're they're not smart. They're not hardworking. What? What kind of stupidity is that? I see a woman in hijab, oh, she must be the mother of a terrorist. I see uh, uh, someone in a yarmulke or sisters, oh, they're rich, oh, they're, you know, it makes no sense. The, the stereotype meets you in front of the nose while the person is still two blocks away. And it's, it's, if it weren't so dangerous, all kinds of prejudice would be laughable. How do you make sense of the longest standing hatred? Well, I don't make sense of it, and I don't want to make sense of it, because it's a prejudice, and prejudice is irrational. For me to decide on the basis of a person's head covering, uh, skin color, dress, who they are and what they are, is, is ridiculous. So I, don't, I can't make sense of it, but I can tell you, and, and I don't want to completely say, you know, push that away, um, it is so old, it is so baked into civilization. Um, every major religion, not every, but certainly every Western major religion, mm -hmm. Christianity, Cath Protestantism, Catholicism, uh, Islam, uh, and political socialism, communism, enlightenment, all of them had as a foundation stone, we're different from Judaism. So it's so baked into the society right. that uh, people almost ex see it as a truth. You know? how, how are you seeing, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, as you're traveling around the world, you know, there's anti-Semitism amongst the people and there's state-sponsored anti-Semitism. Yes. So many of us are watching Ukraine and Russia call each other anti-Semites, China, all these other countries. What, what is that? The, What's going on okay, there? Okay, first of all, there is no democracy that has ever engaged officially in anti-Semitism. Yes, there's been anti-Semitism. The this, this State Department in which we sit, and, and uh, Secretary Biden has acknowledged it. I acknowledged it when we released the White House's strategy on uh, combating anti-Semitism. We released it in the Executive Office building, you know, the mm -hmm. wedding cake building <laughs> next yeah. to the White yeah, yeah. House. And that was the home of the State Department. And sure. in my comments, I said, this is, I'm standing but a few feet from the offices where they denied Jews visas because they were Jews. 
Wow, I have the chills. Yes, yeah, so I got the chills. I got for Klimt when yeah. I did. <laughs> you know? Powerful. Um, Powerful. And uh, so it's here, but but the the governments that love anti-Semitism, either because they believe in it or it's a useful tool, a utilitarian anti-Semitism, are authoritarian. Think of it, Iran, Russia, uh, the PRC, China, um, and China's a surprise. You know, for decades, and you can ask Jews who've lived in China, right. done business in China, uh, uh, people who've worked with Chinese nationals, China, the Chinese people, Chinese nationals, were generally philo-Semitic. Mm -hmm. Love Jews. R sure. Very You're an ancient so. civilization, we're an ancient civilization. Right. You believe in filial piety, we believe in filial piety. You believe in education, we believe Correct. in education. You believe doing well is a blessing, we yes. believe in doing well is a blessing. So, so what happened? Well, since October 7th, we've seen a, a, a real 180 mm -hmm. shift. Wow. And one has to ask why. If it hadn't been before, we would, you know, but it, it's so different now. And these are theories, you know, because we don't know. The Chinese haven't told us. We don't know. But first of all, they have to assume that relying on it and using it uh, will somehow stand to their benefit, will be, will be, will gain for them. Right. Um, one theory that I have, and it's a theory, um, but when I've shared it with Chinese specialists and national security specialists, they haven't left me out of the room at all, um, is that uh, for an authoritarian regime like China, using anti-Semitism and implanting anti-Semitism now, which you can do easily on social media, sure. right. is a way of trying to present Western liberal democracies as failed states. Oh, you think you're so great? You have right. so much anti-Semitism. Oh. You think you're so great? You have so much racism. Right. Now, I want to be careful here uh, of, of blaming foreign actors totally, whether it's the Chinese, whether mm -hmm. it's the Iranians, whether it's the Russians, who seem to be the three major state mm -hmm. actors on this. It's too easy to put it on them and say, oh, you know, it's all yes. from the outside. I, I heard a good analogy from a, a scholar at Johns Hopkins recently who works on this topic. And she said, they add fuel to the fire, but there has to be a fire burning for them to add fuel Correct. to it. If there's no, f if you drop fuel, drop wood on a, uh, it sits there. But if yeah. there's a fire burning, you, you'll get a conflagration. Um, so they have to believe, A, that they have some benefit. So I think part of it is to present Western democracies, whether it's European democracies uh, in the Americas, whatever, is failed states. And I think the other reason is to appeal, potentially, theory, theory, to potentially appeal to countries where you think this might find traction. Mm -hmm. The global south, you know, we used to talk about third world countries, which I think the global south is a better term, but African countries, Asian countries, where Oh yeah, we, we knew that, you know, so um, it's a utilitarian, I don't think it's an anti-Semitism out of commitment, but it's a utilitarian anti-Semitism. And the same thing we saw coming from Russia, you know, attacks on the Jewish agency, attacks on the Joint Distribution Committee, which right. plays such an important role. And they can't just leave Russia because there's a very large right, sure. uh, Jewish population there, um, or depicting Ukraine as a f Nazi state, right. um, as uh, President Zelensky as a Nazi, and when they say to him, he's a, he, no, he's Jewish, they say, oh, this, the Kremlin says he's not a good Jew. <laughs> this is where I'm going to take you. Right, First, right. I don't know what a good Jew is. Right. Right. <laughs> that's already a term. Yeah. Um, second of all, that we're going to take instruction, but I think that's part of it too. And Iran also, you know, to establish itself as uh, a leader amongst Muslim nations. Remember, it's not an Arab nation; it's not an Arab country. Um, and also to destabilize and a means of attacking Israel. So, um, 
we see this coming from bad actors externally yeah. feeding flames which already oh, exist. Within uh, I was going to ask you because you mentioned the Muslim countries. I think in the last couple of years, because of the Abraham Accords, so many of us felt that our Arab cousins and brothers yes. and sisters that they felt a certain way about us. And I was in Saudi Arabia, and I'm finding it's it's shifting a lot. I'm yeah, curious well, what you're hearing. Well, um, because you were in Saudi Arabia after October seventh. Uh, b- before. Before. Um, I, my first country I visited was so, uh, Saudi Arabia. That oh, was wow. the fr- first one. And then I went to Israel. And mm-hmm. uh, A, that worked out better in terms of my schedule, but also I did it uh, to make a point. Right. right. Um, and I've been in conversation still with the Saudis since October 7th. I hosted uh, a, a, a delegation yesterday from the United Arab Emirates here in the State Department, very much involved with the Abraham House. Mm -hmm. Um, which if you haven't seen is worth seeing. I mean, to think that in a Muslim majority, Muslim dominated Muslim country, you have a church, a mosque and a synagogue all of the same size. Because if you know, the mosque always had to be larger. And right. they're gorgeous. They're beautiful, it's beautiful so buildings. It's amazing. It's amazing. Can you imagine in your lifetime, like walking through? Do you think you'd be walking right. through the, the, Saudi Arabia? This is like the project that? director of the Abraham House. He said, "But we have a problem with the synagogue." I said, "What?" He said, "We have to get a minion on Shabbos." Wow. It's hard. Wow. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> it's, it's, a yeah. it's a problem. It's not. It's not near any hotels. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So next yeah. to these multi-bazillion-dollar uh, structures, the Emiratis have put in four or five trailers, you know, like uh, wind streams or something uh-huh. for people who need to stay over shops. So it's that kind is, of, wow. you have the wind streams next to this, you know, but yeah. it's, in a, it's in the museum district. So it's, people have to walk a distance, but people do, and it's, it's worth something. Uh, they just finished the Safer Torah. I got to add, to write in the last Dalit of the Safer wow. Torah in the last in the last couple of Sukim for Dvorah, yeah. um, which, was a, which was amazing. So I think they still want this. They want normalization. It's going to be tougher since October 7th. Right. And that was probably, you know, here I'm surmising, but you'll hear it from Middle East specialists and certainly from Israelis and American specialists that that was one of the motivations of Hamas. You know, this, of this Saudi deal was in the offing. Yeah. So it'll be a different kind of normalization. But but um, they're even not scared so, to still speak about it. No, the no, they not at all. Not at all. Keeping the, the narrative the, alive. The, the, the delegation of Emiratis came to meet with me, Ambassador Lipstadt, Special Envoy to monitor and combat. We didn't just bump into each other right, in right. the hall. We didn't just, oh, we're here, we'll stick our head in and say hello. Yes. It's Ambassador Lipstadt, who's been in the UAE a couple of times. They came and we sat and we talked about it. You know? Amazing. I, I was going to ask you, you know, you, your title is uh, to monitor but also to combat. Yes. And uh, we have, thanks to uh, Jamie Geller, millions of young people who are followers of us on social media and want to understand how can they combat anti-Semitism? What's your, what's your advice? There's no easy answer. If there were an easy answer, you would have it and you would have given to them and I would have it, you know. But they have to speak up. And they have to, sp- they have to educate themselves. What is anti-Semitism? How I might answer? Um, you can't just say that hurts my feelings. You've got to explain to people the absurdity. Where do you suggest they start? Uh, literally take us through what we can do and how we can help. There so are if they want to books. educate. I wrote a book on a, but there have been a, quite a few books in recent years which, which right. uh, help that, which address it um, and what they might say and showing them the absurdity of it. You should put together a reading list. I, mean, that's what right, I'm, I'm, right. I really think that that's critical. Yes. There's just so much there that they don't know where a, to there start. There are three or four or five books that have come out in recent years uh, that are exactly aimed. Uh, they're, they're well based in the terms of a scholarly grounding, but they're aimed at a more general audience. So, so we'll, would, we'll get yeah, that list I together. Think, yeah, absolutely. And th- they'll jump out at you. Um, you're in Israel, the National Library world. Yes. You know? that's so uh, I think that's one thing. They have to speak up. They have to take it seriously. Um, I think that's a starting point, you know. Uh, and they have to fi- And for those who are sort of feel on their own, they have to find a community. Yeah. You know. Um, what do we say? Alto Frosch Nazi board. Don't separate yourself from the community. If ever there was a time not to Frosch Nazi board, not to separate yourself, not to go be a Jew on a desert island. Now yes. is the time. So.
So many people now are waking up. We had people write articles for us. I was a quiet American Jew. Mm -hmm. I didn't look Jewish, live Jewish, sound Jewish, and now suddenly I'm experiencing anti-Semitism. And it's having them question their entire identity. Mm -hmm. Do you think living Jewishly, prouder, a little bit louder perhaps, is that a way to combat? Oh, I, well, I don't know if it's a way to stop the anti-Semite, but it's certainly a way to, for the person who's the object, right. to, you know, if you don't know what you're fighting for. Correct. And you, you're, you know, you're, you're fighting. I, I once met a, a, a man, a professor, who had two marriages. In his first marriage, he said, I was building my career, I was writing my articles, giving speeches, and I didn't really, you know, educate my, my two sons in terms of being Jewish. He comes from a, he came from a Brooklyn, you know, et cetera, and he came from a traditional family, et cetera. Um, but then he remarried later in his career when he was well established, and his second daughter went to day school and, you know, had a uh -huh. good Jewish education. And he said, but I'm very proud of my sons because if ever there's an attack on Jews, he said this to me years ago, um, I know they'll be at the barricades. And on one hand, I was very pleased, you know, he was very proud, proud of this. Yeah. On the other hand, my heart was breaking because they were in the barricades, but they didn't know what they were defending. Yeah. I had an article in the New York Times that now sounds, feels like ages ago, I think right around Rosh Hashanah, so sep September 15th, 16th, on one of the ways of combating anti-Semitism is living a Jewish life. It won't stop the anti-Semites, but it, if you don't know what you're fighting for, then, or if, you, if all right. you know of your Jewish identity is I'm gonna fight, mm -hmm. then it's, you have nothing of, of the, the roots. Correct. I couldn't do my, my job here if I wasn't well-rooted right. in, in my yeah. Jewish identity. We recently ran a mission to, in solidarity for uh, Israel mm -hmm. through Aish. Um, the mission visited with Rabbi Barrow Wine, a wonderful story. Sure. And he shared this idea, I would love your opinion on it, that the survivors of the Holocaust, many of them, mm -hmm. and I spoke about this myself, my, my mm -hmm. parents are children of survivors of the Holocaust, so obviously the trauma affected them in such a way that they felt that they didn't want to give their children the liability of what it means to be Jewish. But what we also didn't pass along for many is the assets of what mm -hmm. it means to be mm -hmm. Jewish. Mm -hmm. So there, if yeah. you all, if you, you know, the Nazis were not uh, selective. You were an assimilated Jew, they went after you. You were the firmest Jew of from, you know, they went after you, it didn't matter. Um, but if, the only thing you knew of being Jewish was its liabilities. Then why should you be Jewish? Correct. Right. You know, why should you identify Jewishly? Why should you be proud of your Jewish identity? If all you know it's a hassle, excuse me, where's the exit? I'm off of this mm -hmm. train, you know? Um, and even, even there are many people, of course, who feel very strongly about their identity. You don't, and I know Aish does so much educating, particularly people who don't have strong backgrounds. Right. Um, you know, you've been you've been robbed. You've been robbed of of the of of the joys, and all you have is the oys. You know, we have uh, we have found that like post October seventh, so many people online have come to H because they want to understand so many liberal causes that they had supported and fought correct, for. They correct. felt mm -hmm. very betrayed. Mm -hmm. that people felt abandoned. Yeah, yes. abandoned. That's the a good word. The causes are not bad causes. Yeah. They're good causes. You know. Being against sexual abuse of women by bosses, by uh, mentors, well, by the women. Me Too movement—it was seminal, it, it, changed it, my it, whole career exactly, and my life. Exactly, exactly, and it still is. And you know, one of the New York Times reporters who exposed the whole thing, certainly the Harvey Weinstein yes. thing, Jody Cantor, is yes. a child, a grandchild of survivors, yes. and very proud of it. Yeah. and talks a lot about her. And I worked in HBO in the entertainment right, industry, right. so it very much affected us. Um, but uh, there was a real failure of uh, human rights organizations, of feminist organizations. Uh, I had an op-ed in The Guardian, the British publication, the left, you know, mm -hmm. progressive, uh, uh, and which I wrote together with Ambassador Michelle Taylor, the American ambassador at the Human Rights Council in Geneva, also a child and grandchild of survivors. And we looked at the uh, gender-based violence, you know, the antiseptic term for rape and uh, humiliation and sexual assaults on women on October 7th. And we said the feminist organizations, the human rights organizations were silent. And we looked then at other instances of gender-based violence, Boko Haram, 
when the girls were kidnapped. Yes. Uh, Yesidis. And all of Hollywood stood up for them. Yeah. Everyone stood yes. up. Yes. Yesidi women. Yes. Um, the Iranian women who took off the scarves. Yes. Sure. Uh, the Yazidi women were treated horrifically. Hor it, it was it was a genocide of the Yazidis and the women particularly. And people spoke up. So we said, Kivyachol as if Manish Tana, why is this violent? Wow. And the only thing we could say is the perception is that these were all Jews. Now, of course, it, they weren't all of Jews. Of course. There were some Israeli Arabs, some Israeli Muslims, some Druze who foreign were Foreign workers. Of, foreign workers, yep. exactly. Um, but the perception was this was an attack. And, and we said it's anti-Semitism. And we published it as two ambassadors, which means it wended its way through many an office in this building with people signing off yeah. on it. So that was the United States government speaking in, in making that determination. Well. I, uh, I was with Rabbi Merv, the chief rabbi of England, and someone said to him, you know, uh, comparing what's going on in the anti-Semitism in Europe versus the Holocaust, and, you know, said, are we in 1943? He said, not 1943, but maybe 1933. And I think there is this sense of we've seen this before in mm -hmm. terms of being a Holocaust uh, scholar and spending so much time. What are the parallels yeah, you're seeing I, today? I, I agree with Rabbi Merv, it's not 1943. The Holocaust was state-sponsored genocide was the German government, together with some, many of its um, allies or associates, you know, um, that engaged in state-sponsored genocide. We're not seeing that now. Now, we are seeing authoritarian countries, Iran, PRC, China, um, Russia, ginning up anti-Semitism. But uh, we're also seeing, you know, you have to look at the, at, as I say, I like to say the, the joy as well as the oi. The country's taking it seriously. Since October 7th, I've been in Germany, in uh, Brussels, in um, Paris, UNESCO headquarters with the French government officials, um, in Canada, um, talking, and I've met with other, our Western allies who have come here. And they take it very, very seriously. Um, that didn't happen during the 30s. Right, for sure. So there is a difference. Am I downplaying the danger? No. But I think it's important to recognize the difference. So how has the U.S. government and the policies that you have now been affected post-October 7th? Um, more seriously, I have never, I mean, we've had many presidents who have condemned anti-Semitism right. from both sides of the aisle. Um, but this president, President Biden, I've talked to him about it, I've met with him, I've listened to him, I've, you know, he feels it in his kishkas, in his kishkas, he really does, he abhors it, um, he understands it, uh, you know, and um, I have found tremendous support from him, from Vice President Harris, from Secretary Blinken. Um, they get the danger. Look, Secretary Blinken arrived in Israel on October 10th, 9th or 10th. And the uh, chills when he arrived. And he yes. said, he said, I'm here as Secretary of State, I'm here as a yes. Jew, his stepfather, Samuel Pizar, survivor of the Holocaust. Um, he gets it. The president gets it. The vice president. You know, and, um, and that's not to say that there weren't other uh, administrations that spoke out, but we've never had a national strategy before, and the sense that we've got to implement this all the more is even stronger now. President Biden always talks about his interaction with Golda Meir as a young man. Yes. I know you've done some work on right. Golda Meir. <laughs> right, I just had a book come out. Uh, uh, yeah, so I'm curious as in terms of, you know, I always, I get, a, I get a kick out of it, you know, but she was the master of the re retort. I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, in the 1950s, there were a series of rapes in Israel, and someone on the cabinet said we should put a curfew in for the women. And Golda Meir said, excuse me, it's the men who's doing the raping. Let's put a curfew for men. The idea of curfews died. <laughs> but, I love it. Uh, I'll, t I'll tell you an interesting story. And it was a, a, a situation I never dreamt I would find myself in. Uh, I was with the Pope on October 10th, the Thursday after the um, attack. And I was meeting with him privately, just me and him and his interpreter. Um, and one of the things I wanted to do was thank him for opening up the archives, which he has done, which previous popes had not done, even though wow. they said they would, on World War II, and about Pius, Pius XII, and, and, various, sure. and, and much research will now be done. And I said, I admire you doing it because um, 
you knew good things, not all the things that would be exposed would be good things. And he said, veritas, say veritas, you know, truth is truth. And I said, yes, but to admit your wrongs is a big thing. And I said, when you did it, I was reminded of the story in, uh, in the Torah of when Joseph was in the prison, you know, in, in Egypt after the, uh, the Potiphar's wife, the incident, and he interpreted the dreams for Pharaoh's butler and baker. I said to the baker, you're going to be killed. The butler, you'll be returned to status. And he said, when you go back, tell Pharaoh there's a Hebrew lad here who's here unjustly. And the butler said, of course, I will do that. And of course, of course, I'll remember. And he forgot. Right. Then Pharaoh had his dreams and he needed an interpreter. And the butler remembered. And, be, and before he told Pharaoh about the Hebrew lad, he said, Et chata'ayani maskir hayom, my sins I do acknowledge today. I said to the Pope, I said, you come from a tradition in which confession is very important, and I come from a tradition also where confession is important. A person confesses uh, slow, easy, you know, in a minor way three times a day, but certainly uh, the Amim Naraim, Elul, and Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, etc. And I said, so to admit, and you have to admit your wrongs before you can change your ways. So when I said that to him, he turned to his interpreter, he said, she's a good theologian, <laughs> which, is, which is so funny because I'm a historian. I'm not a theologian. Right. My eyes glaze over when people discuss theology. But I guess when you get that moniker from the Pope, it's a It's nice a good theology. one. Jews like to spread Torah. Yeah, so yeah. It's, yeah, uh, it's, yeah. <laughs> it's important. You know, we also just read in the Torah, you're interviewing me last uh, at this point, but last week we read uh, about uh, the children of Israel going through the sea on the, on the land, Betochayam Be'abasha. So uh, Rabbi Lawrence Kush Kushner said they were going through a mud. And there were two Jews there, you know, oh, he's taking us through the mud. I only have one pair of sandals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And they missed the miracle because the mud, you know, oh, probably wow. they got to the other side. And when Miriam and the women started to sing and dance, they said, what's the miracle? Right. <laughs> so <laughs> so <laughs> even in these dark times. You'd be a great rabbi, by the yeah. way. Yeah. Uh, enough that I'm a diplomat. <laughs> uh, even in these uh, dark times, uh, and we look at the mud, don't. Don't forget the miracles. You know, Israel is a miracle. Yes. Uh, that Jews exist. That's the miracle. I yes. was asked, them, you know, um, I was once asked, how do I have the strength to do this every day? And this was even before I came into the job, just writing about anti Semitism. Sure. And I said, as a historian, there's no logical reason why Jews should continue to exist. It makes no sense. Mm -hmm. But we're here. We're here and we're resilient. 80 years after one out of every three of us were killed, we're still here. So how can I be pessimistic? So Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Do we I get just, one more question about the Wall Street Journal? Very quickly. Wall Street I, Journal? Oh, if you wanna, Wall, only if you want to tell I just it. Met with, no, I met with the editorial board, and the point I made to them, um, as I'm making to many others, is that we have to think of anti-Semitism not just, and I put quotation marks around just, as a threat to Jews, which of course it isn't, to the welfare of Jewish communities, but it's also a threat to democracy. Correct. Authoritarian governments love rule of law. They hate the rule of law. They hate democracy. Uh, and anti-Semitism is a terrific tool for them. So it's a threat to democracy, it's a threat to national stability. And one of the messages I want to give to other leaders with whom I'm privileged to meet uh, is say, yes, it's a threat to Jews, but it's not just that. If it were just that, it would still be valid to fight. Correct. But it's more. Beautiful. Thank you so much. You're Thank welcome. You. Thank you.